Hello and welcome to Talk the Walk. I'm Azam Khan. Last week, Foreign Minister Wang Yi met with his Saudi counterpart, and the two sides announced plans to host President Xi Jinping in Riyadh in the near future. A Hong Kong delegation led by Finance Minister Paul Chan also recently returned from the Gulf Kingdom. They secured potential economic partnerships, including an Arab sovereign wealth fund to be set up in Hong Kong for the Greater Bay Area investments. Recent tensions between Riyadh and the United States over oil production could also provide an opportunity for China to grow its influence in the region. How are current geopolitical storms facilitating the Gulf's pivot to the east? And how would a Sino-Gulf partnership differ from a US-dominated one? Joining us tonight to unpack this topic is founder and CEO of Hong Kong-based think tank, Global Institute for Tomorrow, Chandan Nair. Mr. Nair, thank you so much for speaking with me today. Well, thank you for having me. Thank you. Uh, around the same time when the US had that pull out from Afghanistan last year, which ended their longest war, um, China announced plans to build 1,000 schools across Iraq around that same time. Would you say that that's a microcosm of not only the shifting of the guard, but the different in style of approach? Well, I think, you know, um, uh, all of these efforts to build bridges between countries and particularly in conflict zones is, uh, is a great value. I think uh, it's important that China and uh, other developing countries cooperate and find uh, new ways in which uh, we reshape and reimagine the future without an over-reliance on Western aid and things like that. I mean, Western aid is still going to be important, but we need to seek to you know, narrow the divides between developing the world, uh, countries in the Middle East, but also with the Western world. Right. So what would you say is the different mindset and the different approach um, from what we've seen with uh, the US-centric one to what we're seeing now more as China, with China's influence? Well, I think that the main difference that most people know is that there's been a view for a while that uh, Western aid, uh, and uh, I think it's not just the US, uh, comes with many preconditions, and it's what's called tide aid. Uh, essentially, its preconditions are you need to have systems of governance that are uh, aligned with ours. You need to input, you need to uh, embrace certain uh, principles and values that are, are important to the West. And, and that's fair enough if that's what the conditions are. But countries also have a right to choose. And, uh, and uh, they are choosing now to have, um, you know, uh, aid and assistance from other countries like China, which do not come with those preconditions. Having said that, I should say that that doesn't mean there should be no preconditions. Certainly, there should be some understanding of, sort of mutual sort of uh, value systems. There should be some understanding of what the necessary outcomes are. But I think in the last 20, 30 years, where many of the developing countries have sort of got disillusioned is where the West has pre uh, imposed preconditions, uh, which are almost duplicitous in that they apply in some places and they don't apply in some. And they've been almost also used with sanctions, et cetera, to punish countries and withdraw um, much needed assistance. So that's the difference between the Chinese and the Western approach or the non or the non-Western countries. But I have to say that, you know, we should not suggest that there are no sort of preconditions in terms of particularly the outcomes that are needed. Right. And obviously uh, finance minister just came back um, from Riyadh. Uh, what was your take on that trip and what could it could possibly mean for Hong Kong in the near future? Well, that's you know that's great. I mean, it's it's very important that uh, Hong Kong, as part of China and the financial center for China, reaches out to different parts of the world. And uh, uh, a trip to Saudi Arabia and the Middle East is in my and the types of uh, initial agreements that you alluded to uh, are so important and uh, long overdue. I would also say that you know I've been saying for a long time that Hong Kong should also reach out to Southeast Asia where there is a large Chinese diaspora and where, you know, the population is, is significant. 700 million people are likely to peak at about uh, one, 1 billion. So reaching out to Saudi Arabia and the Middle East is very important. Reach out to Southeast, uh, Southeast Asia. In terms of very quickly looking at China and Hong Kong's role, if it wants to play this role in the Middle East, we should not forget that there are long geopolitical sort of lines drawn in the sand there. And Hong Kong should play a role, and China particularly, play a role in also not forgetting the role of Iran. 
Um, this is and so not get drawn into that old world of divide and we'll work with these people but not with the others, given the old tensions um, uh, that already pre-exist. So can China, with Hong Kong's help, uh, play a role in sort of uh, bringing together these very powerful countries? It needs to be remembered that Iran's population, I think, is about 80 million. It's, it's double that of, of Saudi Arabia. And uh, if those two, two countries don't come together, we will, Hong Kong and China will play into that same old geopolitical game. So you need to keep that in mind as we go and uh, embrace that part of the world. Right. You mentioned the, there's more lines being drawn in the sand. Um, I think that's more the case now with different geopolitical uh, situations, whether it's the Ukraine conflict um, or policies, uh, different, different policies towards Iran. So now that the, the room between the lines is sort of getting smaller and smaller, um, would you say that it sort of creates the environment for China to be able to, to thrive and create platforms and channels for more discourse? Well, there's two parts of it. I mean, clearly we need less lines in the sand that divide us. We don't need uh, the spaces to become smaller. We need the spaces to become larger. We need to remove the sort of historical grievances, and we also need to move away from a world in which we exploit uh, tensions. So I would frame it differently and say, you know, this is not an opportunity for China based on uh, a more sort of, uh, in a divided world. Uh, but China does have a very important role to play, but bear and, and bearing in mind not to play within what is, um, you know, very, uh, a very polarizing sort of uh, world, and particularly in the Middle East. So I, I go back to what I said earlier. I think China's role here, as it embraces and um, the the Middle East and Saudi Arabia, is can it be a can it be a peacemaker? Can it uh, help uh, that part of the world which has been sort of you know experienced turmoil for so long? based on two things, a religious divide between the Sunni and the Shia world, which has then been exploited um, because of its kind of resource curse, if I can call it that, and uh, sort of set it on a trajectory where it's so divided and where one could argue that division has been exploited by, 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 by powers uh, and uh, been dominated by Western foreign policy positioning that was, um, I think, crudely, you could say, was to divide and rule. I think China should be extremely careful about uh, not being part of that and actually doing the complete reverse. And if China can do that, then we, we are, um, you know, looking to a, a, a safer, fairer world. And a, a, a China that enables the Saudi Arabia and Iran to come together will change, uh, will change the world. Right. It's interesting you say that because since 2013, 2014, for about a decade now, China's approach to the Gulf region has been, um, it's a term which Xi Jinping had coined called the one plus two plus three um, approach, which has a focus on energy, uh, trade, development, um, the usual things that China is very good at. Um, but I was going to ask you how, what can China do to take that to the next level now that it wants to have a bigger influence? And you mentioned peace breaking. Would you say that that's what it would be, like a more nuanced approach um, when it comes to peace breaking a very complex situation in the Middle East? Yes, I think, you know, I mean, that old adage that uh, all countries have self-interest at heart and foreign policy is often dictated by self-interest. But as we have seen, too much self-interest is not in the interest of world peace and therefore it, uh, ultimately, particularly for global powers like the United States and the USA uh, and China, are not in their interest either. So, yes, energy, trade, and development, very important. Uh, but for far too long, energy and basically access to cheap energy has defined the geopolitics and the relationship with oil-rich countries. I think China's approach should be uh, development, trade, and energy, and not allow energy to essentially be the driver. And when it does become the driver, as we have seen over the last 50 years, it has uh, created tensions and the opportunities for divisive politics. So for me, China's role should be uh, development for peace and stability in the region, uh, obviously driven by self-interest too, uh, trade, uh, fair trade, 
and then uh, energy put in that mix. So I would I would reverse the order, and I think that would be China's greatest contribution. Right, and just to echo that, um, Saudi Arabia and the UE have joined the Belt and Road Initiative, and Saudi Arabia has um, recently tried to advance their application for BRICS, which would be a huge development. So just want to take your, your thoughts on what that would, uh, the significance of that. I think that's all great. Uh, I'll come back to what I said. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm not an expert on the Middle East, but if you leave Iran out of that mix, uh, these things don't necessarily work. So if I was, you know, secretary of the BRICS, then I would want Iran and Saudi Arabia together with the clear objective that if you become members of the BRICS, then you both need to essentially be the pillars of stability in the Middle East, two of the richest countries in terms of oil reserves and largest. And that's what we in the BRICS want it to be about. Similarly for China, it was to say that if you wanted, we welcome you as being part of the Belt and Road Initiative, but can we bring Iran along in this journey too? Because it's such an important country, which is oil reserves, etc. If leaving out a, a, the, a powerful, you know, nation like uh, Iran or leaving out Saudi Arabia um, does not uh, plays into the same old game of, uh, you know, the, you're our friends, you aren't our friends, you're in, you're not out. And I particularly focused on Iran and Saudi Arabia because I believe that with um, the the reserves they have, if they could cooperate, get uh, get over old grievances and also uh, overcome the, the the sort of divisive politics of um, contemporary history where they've been used against each other, the world will change. Not only the Middle East, the world will change. Right. Uh, I'll have to stop you there for a moment, Mr. Nair, as we take a quick break. Uh, don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Thank you. Hi, welcome back to Talk the Walk with me, I'm Azam Khan. For those of you who are just tuned in, I'm speaking with Chandan Nair, CEO of Think Tank, Global Institute for Tomorrow. Uh, Mr. Nair, uh, the Global Institute for Tomorrow recently hosted a comprehensive summit on shared common values in the global order. Um, but current constructs are difficult to change, let alone bend. So how can that be overcome, especially given the current geopolitical tensions? Yes, you're absolutely right that uh, current, uh, you know, constructs are difficult to change or even bend. And that's why we need to have these conversations. And, you know, I'm very proud that we hosted that conversation. And there's another, uh, another one uh, in about a month's time. And the whole point of this is that much of the narrative and discussion about, you know, what we see as common values, uh, international values, et cetera, is seen through the lens of the narratives of Western institutions, uh, Western thought leaders, etc. And it's all, all well and good, and we should be listening. But there's hardly any that sort of uh, are seen through the lens of, you know, either the, the Middle East, the Chinese, the Africans, etc. And the whole point is, current constructs are inflexible because they have been essentially constructed with, all, with such ideological sort of uh, beliefs that no one else has any space to get in that. And that space has also been restricted in terms of the platforms available. So we need to construct a lot more platforms, and that's the only way to come, uh, come uh, to change it. We need platforms where we listen to African voices about Ubuntu, culture and values. We listen to Indians, Indonesians, people from Latin America. Uh, the world has uh, a whole uh, spectrum of ideas about what are common values and how they should be sort of um, aligned with political systems in different countries and their histories. So yeah, but my, my point is, let's have much many more of those. Let's not have the censored, restricted discussions about value systems uh, purely in Western platforms, because that's not good for the West either. They should be listening to others, and that's what we're hoping to do. And we should be freeing ourselves of all the ideological sort of battles that we constantly 
uh, kind of, um, you know, converge on because we want to win an argument. Uh, we need to be listening to each other and as different voices come together, be prepared to beg to defer, go back and learn, uh, refashion, but not say my way or the highway. And that's, that's kind of what we're trying to do at the Global Institute for Tomorrow. And we've invited people from all parts of the world to come in. And even people that who have views that, you know, I might not personally agree with, but my God, I want to listen and I want to figure out why do they think that way? Is there something I can take away from it? And, and that's the whole point of this sort of uh, dialogue. There isn't enough of it, despite all the technological advances and despite all the, the tensions at the, global, uh, at the global level in geopolitics, simply not enough. That's, that's, that would be my main view of why we do this and why we need to do more to overcome the current sort of constructs. Right, and how much does the mainstream media play a role in that? Um, it's difficult when, you know, when mainstream media projects a certain, um, you know, there's a certain, like, more of a singular narrative towards, uh, towards a singular discussion forum. So how would, uh, how would you break through that? Well, you know, uh, let's be very clear. When you say mainstream media, you, media, uh, media, you mean Western media. And that's, uh, that's let, let us be uh, frank, is what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Western media essentially controls the global narrative. English is the medium of international uh, discussions, and therefore everything is seen through the lens of the Western media. They have a historical grip on how the conversations are, are portrayed, and uh, they have an audience, even in the developing countries, that believe that if I hear it on BBC, it must be true. If I hear it on CCTV, it must be a lie. Or if I hear it on Al Jazeera, it might be not so good. And if I hear something from Indonesia, it can't be true. So mainstream media, which is the Western international media, is unfortunately trapped at the moment. I wish it could free, free itself and become what it used to be about 30, 40 years ago. But it's essentially gone into a, a sort of almost a nationalistic uh, view. If you're American TV, everything in America is right in terms of foreign policy and everything else is wrong. So yeah, mainstream Western media is, uh, has a lot to answer for in terms of some of the, uh, the in much of what is being discussed today and, and, and not playing its role in allowing diverse opinions to be uh, aired. In that regard, though, blaming Western media is, um, you know, just part of, uh, part of uh, what we all do. But what we need to do in this part of the world and other parts of the world is build robust media platforms that are not, uh, do not become what the Western media has become, parroting national policies, foreign policies, and, uh, you know, demonizing China, Iran, etc without being able to see that the world is a much more complex place and, um, and the need for the West to continue its hegemony cannot continue. So if we are to change that, we need to invest in good media platforms. But we too, uh, in this part of the world, in Africa, need to be extremely careful not to become obsessed with ideo ideology and nationalism and to essentially allow for diverse voices to be heard. And, and, and that we haven't done enough, and thus if we are trapped in the narratives of Western media, the mainstream media, as you call it, well, we are partly to blame because we haven't worked hard enough to create alternative narratives and platforms. I think you're trying to do that, and I wish you all the best. But Mr. Knight, would you say that there is, there's also not an issue, but we have to be wary about the divide between, especially in uh, the non-English speaking world and most of Asia, the divide between the mainly educated, um, sorry, the minority educated um, who speak English and who have access to these forums and uh, to these different experts that were brought together and different English, you know, uh, English medium channels and the majority who don't have access to all that, who don't speak English necessarily. So how, how can we bridge that and find another commonality if it's not um, something which is already com uh, bind together by English? Is that, is that something that's very tricky, especially with Oh, yeah, side. it is very mm -hmm. tricky, and I, I talk about it in my book about dismantling global white privilege, where I say that uh, dismantling global white privilege is not about simply color. 
it's about also, you know, pe people in our part of the world who seek whiteness. And that right. means by that, I mean the economic sort of privileges that come being with associated with that. So yeah. the elites in our part of the world, as you allude to, are also mm -hmm. part of the problem. And right. therefore, it's not simply and because they 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 are subservient to uh, they, they've been educated in that system. They believe everything they hear on CNN, etc. and will not believe as much what they hear on CCTV, etc. They are also part of what we have to engage in this conversation. And that's a very important part of uh, what we have to do. And therefore, you know, um, building that sort of economic systems and governance systems at home that allow, uh, allow for meritocracy but also reduce inequalities is very much fundamental. But there's a cultural war going on, and uh, elites in our part of the world will have to recognize that that sort of privilege will be eroded with time as the great the, the, the sort of larger population of disenfranchised people seek uh, their basic rights. And governments, if they do not uh, respond to the rights of the majority, but the elites will not be their partners. Uh, will will come down with them as uh, as things begin to collapse. So we have right. a lot of work to do at home in building our institutions. Right, and obviously the Qatar World Cup is coming up um, later this month, starting later this month, which China helped to build a lot of the infrastructure there. Um, but there's been a lot of calls for the boycott, um, especially by Europe and different officials in Europe um, over human rights records and all. And it came pretty close to boycotting from different entities. Um, do you think Qatarans, um, but this, this kind of boycott perhaps would not have happened um, if it was in other parts of the world? Obviously, China faced a very similar um, thing in, with, in 2008 with the Olympics. So, what are your thoughts on that sort of? Um, no, is there, I, is, yeah, yeah, I've written a fair bit about it. There's a chapter on sports in my in my book, and I'm about to write a piece in two weeks before the World Cup starts. But <laughs> this is classic. I mean, we saw it in Beijing Olympics. And I think the West uh, does itself a great disservice. People are not so stupid. You know, Qatar is not perfect, mm. but nor is any country. But what happens every time when a, when a non-Western country hosts a global event, the pious Western media and its politicians use it to essentially, uh, you know, uh, bolster their fake morality, etc. Are there abuses that were taking place with foreign workers in, in Qatar or anywhere else in the Middle East? Of course there were. Didn't the Qataris say, we're going to do everything we can to make sure that we you know, address these issues? So initially, the Qataris were, please tell us and we will improve, and went to great lengths to try and do that. Are there still things that could be improved? Of course. That's kind of why the World Cup is there and being offered to a country in the Middle East so that these things can be addressed, people become aware. But to constantly berate and try and punish with boycotts, et cetera, I think the West needs to wake up. The, the world is kind of woke to their hypocrisy. You know, I'll just say, for instance, um, you know, the I think the uh, two World Cups from now and the next Olympics will be in Paris and then the United States. There will be no call for boycotts di despite the mistreat mistreatment of minority communities in France, uh, police brutality, the migrant issue, the amount of people who've died in the in the in in, in the in the seas in Europe, etc. And there'll be no boycott called for in the United States, despite the hundreds of thousands of Hispanics who are traded uh, across the borders to to pick your grapes and uh, cranberries and etc. There'll be no such thing. Sheer hypocrisy. All of us suffer from the the sort of the, the 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 failings of our economic system where exploitation is rife. We need to work hard. But the point of global sports and cooperation is to address these issues, give an opportunity, and do better. I believe that's all the time we have. Mr. Chandan and I are thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me. Thank you. That's all we have for this week. Um, see you next week. Thank you.